Okay, so today we'll uh, continue our exploration of the, we call it the ancient roots of rhetoric. And last time we talked, as you remember, about Mesopotamia, Egypt, China. And today we'll try to cover India, Greece, and Rome. So we'll start with India. But maybe first, maybe this question. How does India differ from Mesopotamia, Egypt, and China? You can actually talk to your neighbors and see, to warm up, to, to think about it. Yeah, at least this uh, exercise maybe had the virtue of uh, pointing to the fact that uh, we don't, some of you don't know so much about India. That could be, yeah. That maybe it uh, had the effect of showing you that perhaps you could profit a little by knowing a little more. Okay. So let's see what we can say about this question when we come to the end of what I had to say about India. So India is not as old as the Mesopotamian uh, civilization, and it's not as old as the Egyptian. And it's not as old as the Chinese. So it's sort of number four here. And if we look at the Indian culture, there is a very old culture in India in the Indus Valley. And in fact, they have a kind of writing system which hasn't been totally deciphered yet. How many of you have heard about this? You've heard about it. Yeah. So, um, but that culture, they, they were living in cities and they had nice houses made out of clay, etc. It seems to be very influenced by Mesopotamia. Um, and we don't really know what kind of language they spoke. Many people think it was a Dravidian language, because later on we had an invasion in India, about 1,500 years before Christ. And they seem to have pushed the people who lived in the Indus Valley south. And if you go to South India today, you find that most of the cultures of the region. So the language that came in then from the north was Indo-European. That is why we talk about the Indo-European language family. Most of the languages in Europe and this language family that came into India are related to each other. And so maybe one of the oldest forms of this language is Sanskrit. Sanskrit is the direct predecessor of Hindi, but it's also closely related to Old Persian, Greek, Latin, Old Slavic, Germanic, Celtic, so you see most of the European languages. So this is the largest language family in the world, as you perhaps know. By far, the largest language family. Uh, the religion of these people, they worship gods of the sky and of nature. In fact, there have been very interesting religious studies showing similarity between the Indian old pantheon, the Greek pantheon, uh, the, and the old Nordic pantheon. They all had sort of similar setup of gods. They were all polytheistic. Um, these, these Aryan people, where they had a kind of government where they had a king and they had nobles, uh, they had freemen, priests, warriors, horse, sheep, iron, copper, and brass. So they already mastered iron when they came to India. So it was not a Stone Age culture. One of the things they carried with them, which still survives in India today, and many people see this as the biggest problem of India, is the caste system. You've all heard about the caste system? So you're born, you're not born? Yeah, yeah. Even you could. <laughs> you don't know nothing about India, but this one is <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> so you're born into a particular role in life, and the worst role you can be born into is being cast less. Now this particular idea of, of social stratification is reinforced by the doctrine of reincarnation. 
So it means that actually you're born into the lowest caste as a kind of punishment, maybe. Either you were an animal who were promoted to be human, or you're a human who had been lowered on the scale, right? So that, well, it makes that this system is very uh, hard to get around. And it's a, it's a big problem still today in India. But it, it has led people who are in the lowest caste uh, to, in a sense, accept their situation because they thought that it, they had no other, that, that this was done so by, by God, by heaven, by the laws of nature. They believed that this was part of religion. So it's a, okay, that, that's a very strong cultural feature of Indian life still. Okay, if we go back to the history then, uh, the Indians are one of the people on earth who have invented a writing system. <coughs> Perhaps it was influenced by the systems that we had seen last time in the West, that is uh, the uh, cuneiform uh, Sumerian script and the Phoenician script and so on. Anyway, around 8700 BC, uh, they have a, a writing system called Brahmi, and it's a form of Sanskrit. And Sanskrit, by the way, means perfected. So it, they had per perfected the language enough to have, a, uh, to have a writing system. The earliest Sanskrit stuff is in so-called Vedic hymns. And they also have various epics that we were going to look at in a little while. Uh, they have a very, maybe the world's first famous grammarian is Indian, and his name is Panini, here, and he uh, formulated, for, yeah, formulated the rules of uh, Hindi, or of Sanskrit, sorry, in uh, very elegant short verses. It, the way they wrote their rules was very often, was done in such a way that it would be easy to remember, because everything was from the beginning oral, there was, nothing was written down in the beginning. So everything had to be done in such a way that it was easy to remember and that you could remember maybe hundreds of rules. Now that, that's a, an art that human beings have been good at at times when there has not been a powerful written language. Uh, okay, under, when the Sanskrit language spread out, it started to split up in different dialects. And these dialects sometimes also get their own written language, and they're called Prakrits. One of the most uh, famous such dialects is Pali. And the reason it's famous is because when Buddhism developed, which happened around 500 BC, uh, it was eventually written down. And then it was written down in this Pali. Uh, okay, when you look at Many of the Indian languages, the caste differences that I talked about are ingrained into the language. So if you belong to the lowest or the caste less society, the lowest caste, when you speak of yourself, I, there are words which mean things like your slave. Okay? Your slave. That's when you speak about yourself. When you speak to somebody who is not of your caste, I mean, who is of a higher caste. And, and you have to use uh, <coughs> honorary titles when you speak to people who are of other castes. When you talk about your own body parts, you have to add the word old. So this is my old arm, okay? To show the other party that they are sort of lower than the others. Um, when we, we look at the names that the people get, the Brahmin, that's the highest caste, they get very nice names, which give them good luck, etc. So son of the gods or daughter of the gods, get okay, names like that. Well, the low caste people get, you know, like pig's foot, <laughs> no bad names. It's not, uh, so th this is, uh, yeah, it's a pretty, I would think in a sense, terrible system, which is deeply ingrained into the cultural language. Okay, speech is highly valued. And, and when we look at uh, the Indian tradition, there are actually two traditions. One is the Hindu tradition with the Brahmins, the highest caste, who were also the priests. And the other one is a very strong Buddhist tradition. But in both of these traditions, they, they think of rhetoric and speech as something very good and something they, 
value a lot. And as I said, when we look at their texts, all texts are originally oral and only later written down. And this writing down of the various oral uh, messages uh, happens around from about 600 to 300 before Christ. But as you can see, it's somewhat after the other cultures we have discussed, right? Well, when we're going to look at Greece, it's about the same time as Greece, actually. Indian uh, philosophy and thinking is also characterized by a lot of abstract reasoning. And Kennedy has some speculations in his book where he thinks that this is made easier for the Indians by the language. So he thinks that Sanskrit and so on, that these languages make it easier to formulate abstract ideas. I don't know if I really believe this myself, <laughs> but it's a claim that, that, that has been made. Um, but I think another important factor is that they had the caste system and that they had a special class, the Brahmins, who from the time they were born to the, when they were died, belonged to a social class where, it, where there was time for contemplation, for philosophy, for discussion and nothing else, and the rest of the people had to serve them. So that, I think, is uh, another very important uh, factor behind why we find so much abstract uh, ideas and philosophy in Indian cultural life. Okay, so if we look at the, um, the old Indian literature, there we look at some different examples. Maybe the oldest one is the Vedic hymns. So this is uh, highly religious and it's uh, yeah, like the oldest uh, things we have in writing. So it consists of something called the Rig Veda collection of 1017 hymns composed to the gods. And it's uh, composed, as you see, between 1500 to 1000 BC. And it's an early form of Sanskrit. And this <coughs> we find, as we've seen in some of the other traditions, that we find couplets, parallelism, so you have you know, lines repeating the same pattern. Um, there are both similes and metaphors, so that this is another sign that there is some kind of abstraction going on in the culture. Uh, the verb to be, and that this seems to be a feature we have in many Indo-European languages, perhaps all, can be used in two ways. So we can say, um, let's say, the house exists, and that one way to say that is that there is a house, okay? There is a house, the house exists. So is, the verb to be, can be used both for existence, but you can also say the house is big. So it can be used to uh, attribute properties to something. The house is small, the house is big, the house is yellow, okay? So having the verb to be in both of those roles, both for existence and for property attribution, seems to not be the same in all languages around the world. But it is a feature of Indo-European languages. And again, Kennedy speculates that this might have been part of what made it easier to have a lot of speculation in India. I don't know exactly if I believe this. <laughs> but you find in the Vedic hymns a uh, kind of celebration of speech. So they seem to have had a goddess called Vak. And Kennedy thinks that this is the same word etymologically as voce in Italian, or voice in English, or vocal. Right in here, vocal means to have, use your voice. And maybe that's true. And this was the goddess of speech. And so there was a lot of celebration of speech and the ability to speak. And and when they made these uh, verses uh, in the beginning, they also had music, which was accompanying it, and they would have uh, special ways of walking around, dancing. But over time, the hymns that they were chanting became incomprehensible to the people who were chanting them. So it became more and more uh, magical, you might say. They were just repeating sounds they don't... This you find in many religions, this has been a, a way to do it. 
you have the you repeat sounds you don't really understand, and that makes it more uh, yeah, more sacred, I guess, more magical. <coughs> Okay, so this was the Vedic hymns. This is the first kind of ancient literature. Second is the Mahabharata. You heard about the Mahabharata? This is uh, very important uh, in, in the Indian culture. It sort of gives early history of the Indian peoples. And actually, this name, Mahabharata, means big India. Okay, so that's actually the name. They even, when you look at the Hindi name for India, that's what you find. And it's organ it's 200,000 lines, so it's a very long. It's organized in books. Uh, out of these books, make the fifth and the sixth book are perhaps the most famous ones. And there's a famous addition to the sixth book called the Bhagavad Gita. Have you heard about this? Yes. The whole thing is organized in so-called shlokas, which is two-lined, unrhymed couplets divided into two parts of eight syllables. So it's very, uh, very conscious of how to use language in a precise, rhythmical way. In book five, uh, you find advice about speeches. What kind of speech should you give if you are sent as an ambassador to another country? If you are trying to get people to start a war, if you want soldiers to go and fight, what should you say? They are also open to um, <coughs> open contention, uh, pointed argumentation, verbal abuse. And you, you have a picture of proud nobles opposing each other. Now, if you think back of what we said about China, Mesopotamia and Egypt, we have not seen this before, right? In all of those cultures, there was a stress of being conservative and following tradition, etc., etc. Here is the first time we see that they're, they're sort of prepared to sacrifice, uh, let's say, unity and peace and respect. So there's a little more. When we get to Greek culture, this is going to be a lot more of this. <laughs> okay, there's another famous uh, Indian epic poet, poem, which is called the Ramayana. And then, there we have an author, Valmiki, and it's written about 200 BC. And it's about a king whose name is Rama. And, but it's partly, it's not a real history, this. It's, he, he is helped by a mythical a monkey king. In Chinese culture, the monkey king also uh, plays a big role, right? Yeah. yeah. Journey to the West, have you read it? Which one? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what's, the, what's the monkey king called in China? Meihou Wan. Wan. Yeah. So I think you took that from India, actually. <laughs> it's, it's, it comes to China in connection with the introduction of Buddhism. Yeah. But it's it like the, a monk has three students and they go to the West to get the yeah. holy Buddhism. Buddhism, Bible. Buddhism actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think that yeah, there have been very interesting connections between China and India uh, on some of these points here. Uh, now this Rama, he seems to be open to compromise, and but he see, so he's more of a traditional type. He's open to compromise and he seeks consensus. This is what you would expect more from the traditional kind of rhetoric. In both of these works, Mahabharata and Ramayana, what you find the rhetoric is mostly concerned with deliberation. You remember what this means? That's when you're trying to get people to act together towards a particular goal. That's the rhetoric of deliberation. That's, I think everywhere in the world, this is the most common type of rhetoric. Okay, there is also philosophical texts in ancient Indian literature. And the most philosophical texts are called the Upanishads. And this basically consists of Brahmins, this is the top caste, 
attempting to create a more philosophical understanding of being than you find in the Vedic scriptures. This was the oldest religious scriptures that I started with talking about, right? And now, but now they're coming to, let's say, a thousand years later, they're starting to think that under this bewildering manifold of different kinds, uh, how many of you from India? None of you? Unfortunately. Okay. Well, India is a country where they have lots of temples. I was in Nepal two weeks ago, and Nepal is like India. They, you know, there are like hundreds of gods. There is a god, there is a, you know, there's a monkey god, there's an elephant god, there's a this god, that god. Everywhere there are gods. And so some people who were, let's say, of a more philosophical kind of mind, they thought that under this bewildering manifold of gods, there must be some kind of unity, some more abstract system. So that's what you find when you look at the Upanishads. They try to, to see all of these gods as just different manifestations of a single underlying kind of deity. Yeah. Um, there is also a kind of rebellion against Hinduism, which occurs around 500-600 BC. And the biggest rebellion is the one which is uh, led, in a sense, by Buddha. Okay? But there is also another smaller rebellion, which led to Jainism. Have you heard about Jainism? Jains are the most radical people when it comes to not killing any other kind of animal. If they are walking, they'll have somebody sweeping the path in front of them so that they should not, by mistake, step on an ant. Mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty extreme. They also don't like clothes for some reason. They like the saints are often naked in Jainism, <laughs> but the Jains are not as they were not as successful as the Buddhists. The Buddhists were very successful, and they, well, Buddha appeared about 500 BC. Um, and he, uh, after a few hundred years, he was actually dominating India. And there was a, uh, a Buddhist emperor called Ashoka, who lived around 200 BC. He conquered most of India, all of India. And he not only conquered India, he conquered what is now Pakistan, Afghanistan, etc. And he put up gigantic statues of Buddha. Have you heard about this? For example, in Afghanistan, and the Taliban wanted destroyed. to shoot it down. Mm -hmm. And he also sent missionaries um, to the Mediterranean. So around the time of Jesus, there were actually Buddhist missionaries coming all the way to the Mediterranean. So Buddhism was at that time very successful. However, a few hundred years later, the Hindus started to say, we cannot, the caste system, so, uh, the Buddhists did not believe in castes. So this was a big liberation for the casteless people and so on. But the Brahmins and the people who had something to gain from the caste system, they did not like Buddhism. So there, there was a counter-revolution in India, you might say. And the Buddhists were thrown out of most parts of India. And uh, so only South India, Sri Lanka, and North India into Nepal actually remained Buddhist India. And that's the way it is still today. But now the Buddhists are, are gaining followers again, especially among the casteless. Because they, of course, in Buddhism, they, have, they are free of the caste system. Uh, a quick question. Uh, yeah. Are they considered traditionalist or non-traditionalist? I mean, Buddhism being uh, fairly ancient, but you have a fairly strong uh, traditionalist um, well, group of people in India. Yeah. So the Buddhists in India, the, uh, the resurgence, are they considered to be more traditional or less traditional? This well, is uh, when it comes to the caste system, they're obviously not so traditional. Again, because that's a very important part of Indian culture, so they're getting rid of that. But, but then, as you said yourself, I mean, they have 2,500 year old traditions of, the, of their own. So I, when I was in Nepal two weeks ago, I went to a Buddhist monastery. And of course, when you're there, you, you feel this is thousands of years of, of tradition. 
So uh, they are traditionalist in some ways and, and not in others, I would say. Um, so as in Indian culture in general, uh, you always start with some spoken words. And only later is it written down. So when the Buddha was preaching, he never wrote down his sermons. He was only speaking. This is also the same in Christianity, by the way. Jesus never wrote anything down. The first Christian Gospels were written down. You know how long after his death? Three, four hundred years after. No, no, fifty, sixty years. But still, <laughs> fifty, sixty years is a long time. You know, you, nobody really remembers what happened. <laughs> That's the same here. These things are written down you know, a long time. Yeah, a long time after he died, actually. But I think it's the same amount of time, 50, 60 years. Okay, so the most original ones was collected in something called the Tripitaka. Sermons and sayings which are attributed to the Buddha, collected at a council of his followers. Well, actually fairly soon after his death. So this is actually more recent, perhaps, than the Christian Gospels. This then is presented in different forms, in sutras and in, for example, the Dhammapada, which is trying to present the whole thing in a more poetic form. And Buddha's teachings in general, he, um, I don't know, do you know the history of what happened to him? He was a prince and he got rid of his, he decided at one point that he saw a lot of poor people and so on and he wanted to escaped from this and so he went out into the forest and he was uh, living the life of an ascetic, you know, not eating, hungering, etc. Finally he saw the light and then he starts to preach the middle way, the so-called middle way. So that's sort of in between asceticism and sensory indulging. Okay? And then he preaches the Four Noble Truths and the uh, Eightfold Path and I mean, some Chinese people here probably are probably Are you Buddhist to some extent? No. Not at all? No, not at all. Not at all? How about you? Sorry? Are you a little Buddhist? Uh, my parents are. Yeah, so you Like, in my hometown, it's a lot of temples. Yeah, so you know about these things, the Eightfold Path and the Four Noble Truths and... Yeah, it's yeah. like... How right way, right way of speaking, right way of thinking, right, you know, all this stuff? Uh, yeah, maybe not. But, <laughs> but it's... Uh, in, 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 in the areas of the world where they are where they are Buddhist, of course, this has the same status as, as I would say some of the Christian ideas around here. Yeah, and, and according to Buddhism, why you know the central problem we have to serve in any is to solve in religion, what is it? It's the problem of suffering. Why is there any suffering? You recognize this? So what should we do then to get rid of suffering? Get rid of attachments. Get rid of attachment. Are you Buddhist? No. But you know this, doesn't yeah. <laughs> That's why I wrote implies attachment, right? So, so suffering implies desire for things, attachment to things. If you don't have a strong attachment to ice cream, you won't suffer if they take away <laughs> ice cream from you. So that, that's the general idea. If you don't have strong attachments, then you will never really suffer. Okay? Then this can get... We talk a lot about this, and what it means in more on deep level, yeah? For Muslims, uh, it's uh, quite the opposite, actually. You have to suffer so that you feel attachment to God, God's presence. Uh -huh. so but, but for Buddhists, the final liberation is uh, nirvana, yeah. where you have attachment to nothing, mm. and you are finally free. That so comes after death for the Muslims. Well, you no, know, actually, for Buddhists, there are certain people who can experience it in this life, and they have a choice whether they want to go into nirvana or whether they want to stay mm. out of compassion for other people, and they're called bodhisattvas. So that's, uh, yeah, they're all in interesting ideas. But that we're not going to do religion now. <laughs> okay, ancient Indian literature also has um, what something called Arta Shastras. And these are treatises on laws and customs. 
systematic treatises on law, where they talk about administration, crime punishment, judicial procedures, and they actually have a fairly well-developed system of justice with courts and judges, prosecutors, advisors, cross-examination of witnesses, a lot of stuff like this. And um, there was one person, Kautilya, who systematized a lot of this, plus other things as well. And he went into, like we, last time we talked about the Chinese Machiavelli, but there is also a kind of Indian Machiavelli, and this, that's this man. Cartilia. He gives uh, advice to autocratic rulers. So how should you win over your enemies? What questions should you ask if you are, if you are a judge in a court process, etc. Okay, in India, as I've already said, the most common type of rhetoric we find is deliberative, where you try to get people to act together towards a specific purpose. We also find somewhat developed judici judicial rhetoric since they did have courts of law. And we find um, epideictic rhetoric where you are trying to, well, cultivate the sense of togetherness in the people. And that's usually done in connection with religious rituals in temples and so on. In all of the cultures where we, which we have discussed so far, uh, Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Chinese, Indian, rhetoric is not separated from political and moral philosophy. That's also so in India. So you have to look at religious, moral, philosophical books to find rhetoric. We'll see when we get to Greek, rhetoric that this actually is slightly different. They are the first culture to separate, <coughs> we'll come to that later, rhetoric from, from political and moral philosophy. So in, we return now to Mahabharata. In book five, there are statements about diplomatic tactics which involve rhetoric. So how should you uh, uh, act toward, how, should, how should you speak if you want to act toward conciliation? How should you subvert your allies? How should you bribe and punish people? Okay? How, in all of these things, language can be a help. And they give you advice on this. Um, speeches of instruction. If you want to call people to arms, if you want to caution them, if you want to console somebody who has uh, somebody has died and they are very sad about the death, what should you say? Lament if you want to have a collective uh, sorrow. If many people have died in a war and you want to together grieve to get rid of the sorrow, then okay. So they have things like that. Uh, Ramayana is uh, that's mostly rhetoric of deliberation. The Upanishads, they have since this is where you have most of the philosophy, this is more like Greece, perhaps, than the rest. They have debating contests where you, uh, you debate with each other. You have, well, who, who is the best debater? Who can argue the best? And um, there is one person, a kind of hero in one of the stories, called Jadnavalkya. He's a Brahmin who wins a lot of debates by always asking for definitions. And uh, if his opponents cannot give the definitions, then he gives one, so he wins. And he can also ask for a system of classification. If then his opponents cannot give classifications, he wins. So this, of course, being able to give definitions and taxonomies, that's still a very important feature of academic debate today. So if you're good at that, then you can more easily write academic papers and you can win academic debates. Um, there is also a kind of sophist tradition in India. The, these are people who go around and teach people how to debate. Uh, and they are not so, not always, like in Greece, they, they are not always truth seeking. So they can teach you how to debate just to win. We'll see that in, Greek, in Greece this becomes uh, 
even more common. Um, <coughs> and there are some negative terms for such people. They're called, it's called eel wrangling. So you know what an eel is? Thin, slippery fish. Okay, so they call it eel wrangling. And uh, these eel wranglers, they can give, get, give advice to rulers about how they should argue. Um, and they often have, they don't have the same opinion, they often argue with each other. For example, the Buddhists uh, did not really like these eel wranglers. So they have some written records of debates with them, and they call these people takis. And then they try to show uh, yeah, well, why the Buddhist way of arguing is superior to the eel wrangling way of arguing. <laughs> Okay, the Buddhist rhetoric, uh, you have this, they are preaching. So Buddha is preaching, they, but it's usually Buddha. Um, but he, it's not really a logical argument. It's, it's well structured in a logical way. One thing follows another, but you don't, you don't have, a, like when we are teaching you rhetoric, we talk about refutatio and things like that. You don't find that. It's the, the mistake, one thing follows another. Uh, there are quite many aphorisms, parables, fables. It, there are also quite a few animal fables. So you know about the fables of Aesop? Now, some of these seem to have had their origin in India and traveled to Greece and then spread to the rest of Europe. Some of you don't seem to know the fables of Aesop. Let's see if we can think of one. The, uh, what is, what is the well-known fable of Aesop? The fox and the raven? Yeah, the fox and the raven. Mm. Do you know about this? Mm. Yeah. So this one probably comes, or something to close to that, comes from originally from India and then travels to Greece and then travels to the rest of Europe from Greece. Uh, but their attitude to rhetoric we can see here. To none speak harshly. Those thus addressed would retort to you. Miserable indeed is contentious talk. Retaliatory wrongs would touch you. So here is, don't make other people angry. Don't quarrel with them. Because if you do, they're going to hit you back. That's the basic idea here. So this is very peaceful, um, I'd say. In this, the Buddhists are slightly different from the Brahmins. They're more open to Oral. And when we get to the Greeks, you'll see there are a lot more of <laughs> So this is, this kind of peaceful rhetoric is similar to what we saw in the advice of Patahotep in Egypt. Remember this advice he was giving to his son? And Confucius in China. So this is stress in Buddhism on sincerity, restraint, and frankness. Here's another quote, turn aside wrath, that means anger, <laughs> with a gentle response. Clarify and seek acceptance of your ideas by phrasing them in terms of predilections and understanding of your listener. So that shows that you should, what, you should try to understand your listener, you should come close, you should not, you should not have adversarial kind of confrontational argumentation. Is this still true of Buddhists? Depends. Largely speaking, yes. Largely speaking. Um, there, are, there is, however, an interesting Buddhist tradition in Tibet where they train young monks. Have you, uh, some, there are some films about this. That's not at all like this. <laughs> in fact, it's very adversarial. And they are trained in a particular way of arguing very tough against each other. So I think, you know, Buddhism is actually. It's, of course, there are hundreds of millions of people who are Buddhists, so there are many kind of traditions within Buddhism. But this is maybe a main current, but it doesn't exhaust uh, the picture. <coughs> yeah, so this Kautilya, which I talked about before, who was summarizing, who had an account of the laws and customs and so on, and who gave advice to rulers, 
He also tried his hand on conceptualizing rhetoric to some extent. And this is chapter 10 of, of the book I referred to before, the Arta Shastra. And he, in this book, he is writing about judicial rhetoric. Um, and then he introduces some concepts to talk about rhetoric. So he has one concept which is here translated as arrangement. The order in which you should present topics. Something he called, well, translated here as relevance, which means that you should not have any contradictions in what you're saying. It should be had, you should have only non-contradictory facts. Completeness, uh, you, you should have enough illustration and examples. Sweetness, when you talk, it should have a pleasing effect on your listener. Dignity, he does not like slang and ordinary language. He likes, he wants the language to be slightly conservative and so on. So non-colloquial words. And lucidity, however they should be well known, so it should be clear to those who are listening what you're talking about. So th these things are not exactly like the kind of rhetoric we are teaching you here. Uh, but they are more, let's say, uh, focused on style. What style should you use when you are trying to convince people? But the purpose is the same as, as what we have in Western, you know, more Greek Roman rhetoric. <coughs> okay, here's a little question. How much of ancient Indian culture and rhetoric are still valid today in India? Now, can I ask you that? You say, I've never been to India, so I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. How should we find out about present Indian rhetoric? And um, trying to find some similarities and differences between ancient Indian and ancient Chinese re rhetoric. So rather than letting you think about this alone, uh, let's just see what, what you think uh, off the bat. How much of Indian culture and rhetoric do you think are still valid today? Nobody has any idea because you haven't been to India. Well, I think, for example, that what we saw about Buddhism is to a great extent still valid. And what I said about the uh, prevalence of abstract concepts in uh, the, uh, as illustrated by the Upanishads and so on. Uh, how many of you, have, have you ever met Indians, Indian philosophers and so on? Do they talk abstractly? Not Indian no? philosophers. <laughs> what? Not Indian philosophers per se. <laughs> But well, maybe I haven't met the right kind of people. But at least in my, I have I have visited India several times, and I have met a lot of people from India. And I must say that they they are actually quite skillful in handling abstract words quickly. So I, I think I think that that tradition is still alive. So my my uh, I would say that uh, you know two two thousand years here of a historical passage has not really changed some of the things. I think that if you think back on what we said about China last time, I think we can also find some similarities in, in the Chinese tradition. And uh, we can ask the same question, of course, when we get to the Greek and Roman stuff. So, but in any case, so let's say we're skeptical that we, we think that uh, maybe present Indian rhetoric uh, is very much more different from what it was 2,000 years ago. How should we find out? You should be experts on this. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> well, the, the, today it's much easier than it would have been, let's say, even 20 years ago. What should you do? Do you mean like practically how we how yeah. we could find out? Yeah. We we could uh, study how politicians speak. And how would you get that data? Uh, they must have some videos. To yes. Them. And where would you find those? YouTube. On YouTube. <laughs> and what would you do about the language problem? Transcripts. And what would you do? Well, what language are they going to be speaking? English. English. Very often, yes. So India is a particularly easy case. Mm -hmm. Because they have, you know, I don't know what it is, seven, eight hundred languages in India. They have tried to make everybody speak Hindi. But 
lot of people don't want to speak Hindi. They think, you know, their language is just as good as Hindi. So what's the solution? They take English, which is the language of those that came from the outside and is not one of the you know, domestic languages. So English is still maintained. You, if I go to India and lecture, I have no problem with English anyway. All intellectuals, all academics and so on speak English. Of course, if you speak to ordinary people outside of the universities and so on, that's a different story. But, but everybody who's been educated knows English. And uh, most of the politicians have been educated, so they also speak English. If they speak, even if they speak Hindi, they have a risk of not being understood by those who speak Bengali or Gujarati or... Now, these are big languages. Do you know how many people speak Tamil? 100 million. We're not talking about small languages, these are big languages. So, uh, so English has a, has, a, has a strong position in India, and that makes it easy actually to investigate this. And with the internet and the coming of YouTube and stuff like that, it's also fairly easy to get data to see what's going on. Of course, if you wanted to do something more, a little more work, you would have to go to India and try to, to see how, yeah? But do they speak the English language by using uh, Indian rhetorical um, instruments? Well, that's what you would have to discover. So that, that's a very good question. When you start to use English, are you, is English and American, is an English and American way of thinking directly imposed on you? you know, so yeah. let's say, I'll use an American metaphor. I went out with this girl and I didn't even get to first base. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody here not to understand it. You all understood it. Does that mean that you all know a little about baseball? You must, you must no. know a little, no? No, it's not about baseball. We just yes, it is about baseball. Yeah, it is about baseball, but for me it was not about baseball. I didn't even know the connection between... What do you think they got get to first base then? Yeah, the, it, that must be the case, of course. But I, I wasn't aware of that fact. I just, I just knew the meaning of that phrase. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but, but you know, when we speak English, there are lots of, of phrases of that type, which are kind of metaphors, which, well, force us, in a sense, to be aware of, of a lot of cultural phenomena in England and America. To what extent is that a damp damper of letting Indian cultural phenomena come up and take over English? So that's something that somebody could study, actually. To what extent can Indian cultural phenomena bubble, co percolate up through English? And to what extent are they forced to still use English and American kind of metaphors and ways of thinking? That, that's an interesting problem. In There are other big cultures in the world where they have, let's say, Nigeria. English is the official language. Okay? It's not the first language of, well, maybe very, very small part of the population has English as the first language. South Africa. English, again, a slightly larger portion of the population have English as the first language, but it's not, not more than 2 or 3%. Right? So in many parts of the world, this is an interesting question. But it, of course, since English is used, it makes it possible to investigate this with the uh, easily available data on, on the internet. OK. so. How should we find out? Well, internet or we actually travel there and we take a look. Make some recordings, yeah? I was just thinking about the, the English that is spoken in India. That, that must be quite different from the contemporary English, which is American English right now. Uh, because you have, you I'm, I'm thinking heard of Indian English? Yeah, I've heard it. And yeah. I, I believe that it is more British English and it is a quite older form than what is spoken, what is spoken in Great Britain right now. And I'm thinking of French, for example. Quebec Quebecoin French is, is an older form yeah. than what French people, how French people speak in Paris today, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So that must be the case even for Indians, so that they don't say first base, but they speak proper English. No, they would, actually in India, first base would be uh, unusual. It would be more, that's not cricket. <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. LW, what is it called? Leg, leg before wicket. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, but in India, everybody plays together. All, if you look, if you travel around India, you will see small boys everywhere playing cricket. Mm -hmm. That's the big sport. And so you find that kind of a. Yeah, uh, well, in English in India, yes, you're right, it's British English, and yes, you're right, it probably has a, a few uh, older, uh, well, perhaps not the latest news from, from England, from Great Britain. But of course, and in addition to that, it has a number of its own specific features which have arisen in India. Features of pronunciation, phrases, and so on. So here you actually see Indian, I would say, you see Indian culture bottling up through English. And it, you could say there is a kind of standard academic Indian English, which is slightly different from English in Australia, Canada, England, or America. Okay. So now, the last question. Try to find some similarities and differences between ancient Indian and ancient Chinese rhetoric. <laughs> Nothing? The link must be the religion of Buddhism. Well, it could. That's one link, that you find Buddhism in both India and China. So, so there are certain parts of the population who like this kind of pacifistic type of rhetoric. So that's one link, yeah? Buddhism provides the, the, the language connected with at least majority Buddhism uh, might be one link, yeah? Anything else? Well, it seems to be the case that both India and China were fairly well organized at least at times. And that we had occasion for people to come up who gave advice to rulers. And in both of the countries we have at least one Machiavellian-like person who gives even controversial advice of various types to, to rulers. Uh, you might say a difference might be that China is more conservative and traditionalistic than India. They are not, China does not seem to have been as open for uh, say, disputes between people. And we'll see that India, in turn, is not as open as we'll, when we talk about Greece, which is even more open. But that, that seems to be a difference. Anyway, I would like you to try to think about this because next time and the way time after that, you will have to in the assignment and so on we have, you have to actually put something down on paper to relate in relation to questions of this type. Now we take a short break and then we continue with Greeks and robots. So now we're going to go from India to uh, Greece and Rome. And again, we do some history first. And the same people that came into India also came from the north to Greece. So people think that they came from somewhere in Central Asia and spread east and west. And they came to Greece around 2000 before Christ. And there was a first uh, kind of Greek culture which uh, also existed on Crete. And it's also known as the Minoan culture because there was a well-known king of Crete called Minos. Mm -hmm. uh, they, had a, they had a kind of writing, which is normally called Linear B, because it was classified that way the first time they found it. And for a long time, people were not able to read it. But nowadays, we are able to read it. And so it has been uh, deciphered. Uh, this culture and also the system of writing was lost about around 1,200,000 when, when some new Greek tribes came down from the north and conquered those who had come before them. They're called the Dorians. And so they developed a new Greek culture, the second Greek culture. Uh, where they had 
oral poetry, which in Western cultures is very well known, namely the Iliad and the Odyssey. I think most of you who have at least come from Western countries have heard about this. Um, when they did this, this was also originally oral poetry and only later on written down. So that seems to be the case most over the world. In the beginning it's done in a way which can be memorized and it's oral and then later it's written down. When they wrote it down, they, since they had lost their first writing system in the RB, they now took over the Phoenician writing system but they simplified it and they added vowels because as you remember Phoenician is like Arabic phonetics is only consonants no vowels so they added vowels and uh, beginning like when we talked about cuneiform writing which was a lot earlier 5,000 years earlier perhaps uh, the first things it was used for was like ownership commercial but over the years, it later, they start to write down these uh, epic tales, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And they, uh, first they write on wood and skins, and later on they learn from the Egyptians that they can write on, uh, on papyrus, and they also get uh, parchment to write on. Okay, so this is written down then, and here you have the Iliad and the Odyssey. When I went to school in Sweden, we had to learn parts of this. I don't know. Nowadays, probably. Who is Swedish here? Are you Swedish? Do have you, gone, have you learned anything like this in school? No? No, I read it by myself. By yourself, but not in school. It's not part of the set curriculum. No. See, this is Swedish schools are going... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. When I went to school, it was part of the But it was mentioned. Yeah. yeah. So you never r read about in Swedish Den Yelm om Susan de Hector. We had to read, write, <laughs> read and write things like that. Okay, another well known Greek character, maybe not as well known as Homer is Hesiod, and he wrote uh, something called the Theog Theogony, and which is more about ordinary life. Both, both of these actually influenced all of the Greek world. So if you were an educated Greek, after Alexander the Great, Greek culture spread all the way to India, and they conquered Egypt, etc. So it was the general language around the Mediterranean until the Greeks were beaten by the Romans. And in this so-called pan-Hellenic pan world, this, these works were, well, known by everyone. They were like, yeah, I don't know, the Quran in the Muslim world, or the Bible in the Christian world, <laughs> etc. <coughs> and in these, you find traditional epithets, formulaic phrases, and it's, all, it's written in something called dactylic hexameter, which is a, a certain kind of rhythmic prose. In them you also find both similes and metaphors. And there is a movement in general from similes to metaphor. And similes, you remember, is where you make the comparison explicit. For example, brave as a lion, rather than he is a lion. If you remember the Australian Aboriginals, they went the other way. They started with the metaphors, but here we sort of start by making a comparison and then we move to metaphor. Okay, rhetoric, as we will see, and then developed in Greece and was later transmitted from Greece to Rome. Now, so here are some distinctive features of the Greek Roman rhetorical tradition, which makes it different from the others that we have considered so far. So it's, it has an unusual contentiousness. What does contentiousness mean? It means that you are willing to dispute in a hostile way in public. Of the ones we have considered so far, we found 
the closest to this in the Brahmin Indian tradition. But the uh, Mesopotamians, Egyptians, Chinese, and so on, they did not like this. You're supposed to show respect. You're supposed to show uh, that you want to follow old tradition, and so on and so on. So, but here in, in Greece, we, we find this. And to some, mostly in Greece, but um, to some extent in Rome, slightly less in Rome. Because in Rome, they had now gone into having an emperor and so on. Of course, you cannot show too much disrespect of an emperor. That's not a good idea. <coughs> so it get, gets toned down in Roman rhetoric. Um, and what also is very distinctive is that the first well-developed rhetoric is judicial. While uh, that's not the case in all other in a number of other places where it's more religious and so on, but here it's it's uh, in courts of law. We'll come to that. And another, a third, uh, very distinctive feature is that they create rhetoric as a separate discipline. So they start to teach rhetoric, which is not the case in any of the other cultures we've looked at. And then, in fact, rhetoric, after a while, became the most important subject in, in the schools, in the secondary schools, okay? So if you have a primary school where you learn how to read and write, and if you then have a slightly higher education, they didn't have universities in the sense that we have, but if you talk about the secondary education, what you learned mainly was rhetoric. So let's look at something about the rhetoric in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, they are not, in the Odyssey, people are not concerned with writing. This is really before the period when writing has been reintroduced. It seems that only one reference is made to writing, and it's, you see what's in the brackets there. Dire signs write, written on a folded tablet. That's what they say dire signs. So that means that they did not really like writing. They were in favor. They were suspicious of writing. But there are many passages about oral poets. There are many deliberative situations where the Greek warriors are going, trying to argue you know, with each other how they should go to war with Troy and how they should conquer Troy and whatever. And uh, there's lots of opportunities for quarrels and for uh, convincing other people and so on. Uh, there are famous addresses which people could quote later. For example, the address of Odysseus to, uh, to Achilles. And when you look at the structure of those uh, of those uh, speeches, you find this kind of structure which we have seen before: proemium, narratio, proof, and epilogue. And when you look at the speech itself, you find a mixture of logical, ethical and pathetical persuasion, means of persuasion, yeah? Uh, did they have punctuation in written language? No. Because I, I was thinking, why, why were they so skeptical for writing? Maybe that was why, because that they couldn't give the same sensation while they were writing, because there, no pen, there are no punctuations. Uh, I don't think that's the reason they were suspicious, but, it, but it's true that that made uh, writing uh, difficult. Uh, in fact, they did not. Punctuation was not really introduced until the Middle Ages, <laughs> or or it was slowly introduced. In fact, it, it, there were no there were no spaces between words. Have you ever heard about punctuation being uh, a revolution in writing? Yes. Okay. I well, have. Maybe that's why. Uh, and the revolution <laughs> occurred uh, after Christ, slowly, yes. especially during the medieval period. So that actually was a big innovation, and also having spaces between words made it easier. Mm -hmm. So, let's say around the time of Julius Caesar, which is yeah, just before Christ, right? He was one of the few people in the Roman Empire who could read silently. Nearly everyone else had to have a slave who was reading it aloud. And a slave would have been especially trained to, you know, to read even if there were no spaces between words and no punctuation signs. 
So it was a lot harder. Do you, are you, any of you acquainted with any kind of writing system today in the world where they have no space between words? Uh, which one? Japanese. Japanese? Yes. Japanese? It depends. Sometimes they do. Well, uh, it depends. The thing is that usually a word starts with a kanji. Yeah. And so they have uh, suffixes yeah. in the hiragana. Right. And then the new word starts with a kanji. Yeah. And um, what do you call them? Uh, um, sorry, I'm blank. You know, w the words that unite other words, they're called. Uh, you know, you're not kind of no, I mean, prepositions. Huh? Yeah, prepositions. Yeah. Um, they are usually also in uh, in hiragana. Well, they are in hiragana. Yeah. They're, they're not kanji for them. And, but they are usually very clearly seen in. So the only problem uh, when reading Japanese is if you omit kanji. And instead of kanji, are using hiragana, like well, children usually do because they don't have learned all the kanji. Right. And so it's uh, it could be uh, a bit different. But then again, children usually have spaces between words as well mm -hmm. before they learn to read kanji or write. But one language which does not have it is Thai. Yeah. Thai is actually very difficult to read. If, uh, unless you, I mean, of course, you can read this if you're trained. But it's it's uh, it makes it a lot more difficult. And if you look at all Greek and Roman inscriptions, they did not have the space. So it makes it a lot harder to see what's what's uh, Okay. In the Odyssey and Iliad, you also find long similes. You could find a lot of epidictic lamentation for the dead, because many people, like these were wars, right? They were talking especially the Iliad. So there are many people who are killed, and then they have to get together and have collective uh, grieving of the dead. Mm -hmm. So here is Hesiod's works and days. He gives advice on work, how to live justly and piously. He also gives examples of enthymemes. And remember, enthymemes are non-logical arguments, but which are valid, well not valid, but accepted because people are used to that way of thinking. Uh, he has a metaphor which he personifies for example, yeah, both animals and things, and there are similes. Then we have two famous history writers. So history writing, uh, as we normally think of it, was, uh, that, well, we've already seen that it existed in China. To some extent it exists in India, but in Greece it was like given a major step forward here. By, uh, for example, Herodotus. He's often seen as the father of Western history writing. Uh, in this, he reports uses of rhetoric, mostly deliberative rhetoric. He reports many speeches, and these speeches are given to councils or to assemblies, or as in China, by a certain person to a ruler, and that person gives it to some kind of advisor. So they, this, this is sort of similar to what we saw in, in the Chinese uh, tradition. Another famous uh, Greek historian is this guy, Thucydides, I think it's pronounced in English, I'm not sure. Thucydides. And he uh, adds to what you find in Herodotus, debates. So he, and there he gives accounts on both sides of the issue. So you can see that they are debating. And one famous debate that apparently was, was uh, that they had to face was uh, the issue of expediency versus justice. So expediency means what is efficient. Uh, let's say it would be efficient for an army to, if they captured, let's say, 100 people. And it might be then that uh, People say, oh, the most efficient thing is to kill them. And then somebody would say, but that's not right. You shouldn't kill people just because they were captured. So then the, the it, justice would be on the other side. So then they have a debate. What is efficient and what is just and what is most important? And so they, they present a number of cases of this sort where justice is um, put against efficiency. And this is part of, often, of deliberative speeches. 
And like in the uh, Iliad, you find epideictic funeral speeches. For example, here is one very famous one which was given by Pericles uh, for those who were fallen in war. Pericles was a, uh, an Athenian uh, politician. And uh, Athens, well, if you know history, you know Athens was in war with Persia, but not only with Persia, also with Sparta and with many other places. With, uh, I think with Syracuse on Sicily. But they had many wars and they had many people who died. So they had to have this kind of speech. <coughs> okay, so what types of rhetoric do we have? Deliberative, which we've already seen is the oldest and most common around the world. Epidictic, which is used then in ceremonial locations when you want to cultivate the feeling of togetherness. And judicial, which is then most forcefully developed in Greece after about the year 400. And what is so distinctive, as I've said several times, is that Greek rhetoric is contentious and eristic. What does eristic mean? Well, it means more or less the same as contentious. <laughs> it means that you uh, you can quarrel with other people just for the sake of quarreling. You don't necessarily quarrel to find the truth. You quarrel to show that you are best and that you win over the other person. This is to some extent, well, it is much more accepted in old Greece than anywhere else that we have seen so far. Yeah? But that must have a function too. Is it yeah. like maybe to, when you win that uh, debate, you have a situa you have a situated ethos for the next one because you are good. because you're skilled. You, so yeah, you're proven good yeah. at it. So yeah, yeah. something like that. So you could you could uh, win recognition, fame, and so on by being good at this. Okay. Yeah, that's that's why the well we'll come to that. The sophists developed because they were the masters of this. They knew how to do it. Okay, so there was not necessarily any conservative, there's some restraint, not consensus and control like we found in most of the other cultures. But instead, here's another word which means more or less the same thing, but altercation. That means that, that you hit and you argue tough. Open contention, emotion, blatant flattery, personal denunciations and invectives. So you could call another person, you idiot, and so on and so on. Which is not, I and mean, if you compare this with Confucius' is counseling in China, it's very different. That's not what you're supposed to say to your opponents. Okay, so the more another person could be dishonored, the greater the honor to the opponent. <laughs> so this is, you know, that rhetoric and debating becomes like a contest, like a war. Like, you know, the Greeks also invented the uh, Olympic Games. So they liked games and contests in general. Compete, you know, competing each other to see who is best. This was a, a strong feature of Greek culture. And they had oratorial contests. Sounds like uh, an old version of the United States. They also contests. <coughs> Different from this country, by the way, Sweden, where they don't like contests as much. Mm. Yeah. It's one of the things that they introduced in Greece, which uh, had uh, actually a quite big importance. That was the idea of the majority vote. Okay, so if you go to China and, and more, more traditional Greece, not Greece, but uh, Egypt and so on. Normally the goal of rhetoric was to achieve consensus. Everybody should think the same way. So you could do that by tying in with tradition and, you know, and the, what people have done before. So normally people would say, yeah, we've always done it that way, so let's do it that way once more. But here, by having majority votes, they would say, well, who's right? Now, instead of trying to convince everyone, you could say, let's count how many people think A and how many people think B. 
So if just one person, one more person than on one side than on the other side, then the side with the more people wins. Okay? This idea we haven't seen in any culture before Greek culture. So they would they would use this method, show of hands, shouting. They even developed secret ballot. So they had a system where they had urns with little white and black balls. And you would put your ball, white or black, in the, in the appropriate urn. Now, this was used politically and it was used in courts of law. And it had an effect on rhetoric. There was no need anymore to get everybody to think the same way. No, no need to secure consensus which is what you'll find in most traditional cultures. You have to secure a consensus. Everybody should think more or less the same way. So you have to make sure that nobody gets really offended and not left out. Sweden today is still that way, <laughs> I think. Uh, but this system then of voting gives you an ability to ignore extreme opponents. You don't have to worry about that. That guy is you know, hes so crazy, we don't have to worry about him. But in a consensus system, you have to worry about everyone. Uh, <laughs> you can concentrate on solidifying your own side. You don't have to compromise. The, more, the important thing is to win. And this, this whole idea then of just counting votes and so on, this helps to preserve differences between uh, opponents, rather than going for harmony and uh, everybody thinking the same way. So you get a society where you have differences between people who are arguing with each other. Yeah, well if you look at their way they were uh, arguing, they have arguments from probability, uh, they have uh, the arguments, they, they know about the character of a person, and from that they can try to predict what likely actions there are. Because they were not so concerned about the way in which they would win an argument, they could, for example, win by bribing someone. Uh, or they could win by threatening them, or things like that. This means that they didn't really trust what people would say in a court of law. If they said, I saw him kill him, then the Greeks would sit there and say, how do we know he's not lying? <laughs> he might be lying. Okay, so that means that, that's what this means. They relied on circumstantial evidence. That means that it's not enough to just hear somebody say something because that person could be lying. You have to have some details about how the thing happened, you know, the circumstances around the deed. They want to hear much more details which supports the story. So that's closer to, I would say, the modern way of thinking, at, uh, in, in at least Swedish courts of law. They have very strong requirements on uh, evidence. And, and the same way here. So they, they, they needed more evidence than just direct statements. Okay, so perjury, it's, I'm misspelling it, perjury and forgery disqualified their direct witnesses. And there was a lot of use of anti-memes and various paradigms of reasoning, of course. When they were arguing in general, however, they were concerned with a kind of logical standard. But if you could show that your opponent was contradictory. If they were saying both it is raining and it is not raining in the same talk, that was not good. Then you were losing. So they were very concerned with removing contradictions. Again, we see a difference here to the Chinese yin yang tradition, where people would say, you know, it's okay, we always have contradictions, they have to harmonize with each other. Here, that was not good at all. Remo remove contradictions, they're not allowed to be there. And another Chinese idea which we saw with Mencius, that you have multiple perspectives. Well, A thinks this way, B thinks this way. No, no, no. In the Greek way, you don't. There's one way. A correct way. So, other, you know, if you have this multiple perspectives and so on, it's much easier to reach consensus. But if you have the idea that there is, a, there is one truth, the correct way to see it, then you get contentious argument. What is that truth? <coughs> 
Okay, so we have look at the style now. We have seen that contentious arguments were accepted, lies accepted if effective, slanderous in invectives accepted in a court of law. You can, you can slander people. He is a well-known li liar. He is a well-known thief, you know, things like that. Um, flattery, common and accepted. You wonderful judges, you will of course see my innocence. So this led certain famous philosophers in Greece to dislike rhetoric. Perhaps the most famous person to dislike rhetoric in Greece was Socrates. He dismissed rhetoric as a form of flattery. When he, he tried to define it, but of course that definition is not a good definition at all, but it's a definition you give it to show that you don't like something. Aristotle, who was, as you remember perhaps, a student of Plato, and Plato was the person who wrote down what Socrates said. Um, he, by that time, things had developed somewhat in Greece, and there were several schools of, of rhetoric taught by so-called sophists. And Aristotle then saw it as part of his um, work on, on systematizing what people knew was also to Try to systematize what was what he thought was known about rhetoric, and that's why Aristotle is so famous in the history of rhetoric. He was actually the first person to try to to give a systematic account of what rhetoric is all about. <coughs> when we continue, and, and the Greek tradition goes to Rome, this uh, habit of including flattery, ways of flattering people, became even more popular in Rome than it uh, had been in Greece. And uh, there, are there are certain words which have to do with how you praise a ruler. One of the words is this word, encomia. This means to sing the praise of a ruler. Say how wonderful this person is as a ruler, etc. Another word which is sometimes used for more or less the same thing is eulogy. E-U-L-O-G-Y. And okay, so that was an important part, especially in Rome. You should sing the praise of those who are above you. Uh, very few people, in fact, in politics, as distinct from the courts of law, dare to tell an audience what they did not want to hear. This was done sometimes in Greece and very seldom in Rome. So a very famous politician, and I think I mentioned before, Pericles, he did this. And um, another very famous Greek orator, who was also a politician, Demosthenes, uh, tried to do this, but much less successful. Actually, the general public condemned him. So th this was a risky thing, to try to tell people what they did not. You are really not uh, waging this war well. You are, you are a coward, you're not fighting, etc. You, you should not tell people that when they get angry. <coughs> okay, so here is the first sort of formal structure of, to of speeches that we find. And it's, well, it's still quite good structure. You start with a proemium, some kind of introduction, and you give your story, and you give some evidence, and then you summarize. This structure developed above all in the courts of law. That's, that's its origin. But then it was also transferred to more political speech. Okay, another important factor in Greece was the fact that we had um, tra walking teachers of rhetoric who, who were called sophists. And Sof Sophia is the goddess of wisdom, so they were supposed to uh, be uh, people who were interested in becoming wise, I suppose. And they often. Um, well, they, they turn out in the end to be very skeptical of what most people were saying because that was a way to, to learn how to argue with other people. And they were also quite often relativistic. 
as we've already said, they show great tolerance of lying. They, in their arguments, they often use, they often use irony and satire. Uh, but because all of these types of rhetoric were allowed, rhetoric did not only serve as a conservative force to preserve the existing power structures, but it could also start to work as an instrument of change. And it also led to an openness uh, for more objective logical arguments, which was like a, a presupposition of the kind of philosophy and science that we found in the region. Uh, more in Greece than in Rome. <coughs> okay, as I've said several times, the, the beginning of, the, of Greek rhetoric actually is found more in the courts of law than in the, uh, in the political uh, assemblies. So it was there that they first invented this idea that you could have a majority. So they had several judges, and you, if you look at some of the Greek uh, assemblies and courts of law, they would have things like 201 or 21. They would try to always get an uneven number, so that you, they would make sure that, that, that you could always have a majority. Um, and you were not allowed to have a lawyer representing you. You had to learn how to speak on your own behalf. If you were accused of something, you had to go and to some sophistic teacher of rhetoric who would tell you how to argue in a court of law. This, this was part of why it, it was possible to, to develop a, a, a group of people who could teach rhetoric. It was required in a court of law that you were able to defend yourself. So both the prosecutor or the plaintiff, that's the person, and the defendant spoke on their own behalf. No professional lawyers. But there were professional speech writers. Uh, so you could hire somebody outside of the court of law to help you to write your defense speech. Then you would have to go somewhere and memorize it. So that's why the uh, techniques of memory were highly prized in antiquity. And there were several methods to learn how to memorize the speech. Do you remember some of these things? So you could imagine that you had a house and you had several rooms and you'd put the arguments in each room and you go through the rooms and you, and you give your speech. <coughs> so the needs of this judicial procedure led to handbooks of public speaking in courts of law. And if you read those handbooks and you had a teacher, then you were able to demonstrate credibility and logical arguments and to keep the interest of the audience. Okay, so here we have some of the features that you've seen before. Invention, arrangement, style, memory, delivery. And as I've said, the classical structure of such speeches were developed in the courts of law. And then later on, transferred, also used uh, when, when in political assemblies. Okay, if you look back when people started to write about rhetoric, like in the other cultures we've seen, there, there is a kind of meta-rhetorical -rhetor consciousness, awareness developing. And so some of the early terms for rhetoric in Greek were peito, and logos rhetorike, this is, uh, this is the word which we still use. This word, to cover the art of speech making, persuasive speech making, was used in the Socratic dialogues. <coughs> now, another thing that happened uh, in Greece, uh, remember I had these three features, and the third one was that uh, rhetoric developed as a separate discipline. So early writers in Greece, as in China and India and so on, did not actually distinguish rhetoric from uh, politics, ethics, philosophy. 
But, but this happened to some extent in, in Greece. And it happened then first in the dialogues of Plato, for example, Gorgias and Phaedros, and but it happened in a big way with Aristotle's book, which is called Rhetoric. This was written in 335. And in this book, Aristotle then standardizes ethos, logos, pathos. Those are the things you, we have been teaching you in the other courses. And he takes from judicial oratory proemion, that's the introduction, that's where you make sure that you get the intention of those you're speaking to, attention, and that you uh, that they believe you, that they think you uh, are sincere, that you're trustworthy. Then you have the narration, the topic that you're talking about, and then you have your uh, proof, the, uh, the evidence for what you're saying. And then towards the end you have the epilogue where you recapitulate your arguments and you stir the emotions of those, you stir them in a, in a way which is positive for you those people that you're talking about. <coughs> From the sophists, they, we also got this tradition of having debating. So you have arguments on two sides, and you can train people in switching from one side to another and to find new, new arguments. And they also presented lists of beautiful words which would convince people if you use them. Um, Anaximenes was a well-known person who uh, was given the task of educating Alexander the Great in rhetoric. And he, uh, he wrote a treatise on this, uh, where he tries to cover judicial rhetoric, and also, but also uh, more epideictic and, and deliberative rhetoric. And then we have one of Aristotle's students who was called Theophrastos, and he, he developed what Aristotle had uh, done further. So, with all this, what happens is that we get rhetorical schools, where you can, you can uh, apply as a student and you can be especially trained in rhetoric. And that, this is when rhetoric becomes maybe the most important part of secondary education. So maybe the first school was founded by a person called Isocrates. Uh, and in his school, students were trained both in written rhetoric and spoken rhetoric. So they had to write rhetorical pieces and they had to deliver good speeches. They had declamation of speeches. And there was also some theoretical development here. For example, something called the Stasis Theory. Um, this is something which can be handy if you're trying to, uh, to compose a speech. Did something happen? What was its nature? What was its quality? And what actions uh, should be taken as a result of these things? So that's called Stasis Theory. And. Uh, <coughs> This was actually developed in order to help people to clarify issues, for example, in, in a court of law. So this is in the 300s we get these rhetorical schools. So when the Romans captured Greece, and that happened, uh, well, just before Christ, you might say around 50 BC or so, they, they captured this. Uh, then, well, even more perhaps before the Romans captured Greece, Greek culture and language had very high status in Rome. In fact, Julius Caesar was bilingual. He spoke both Greek and Roman, Latin. And when he made love to Cleopatra, her first language was Greek. And apparently their love affair was in Greek, right? So he, he, had, he had no difficulty in switching to Greek. So, and most educated Romans were uh, well acquainted with, with Greek culture and language. So it was not so difficult for them to uh, import Greek rhetoric to Rome. And let's say that they started to import Greek rhetoric and Greek traditions around 200 BC. 
And this then continues, I would say, for about 600 years. So when the Roman Empire falls, which is around 400, AD, all this time there have been uh, rhetorical schools and rhetorical teaching going on both in Greece and Rome. So some of the well-known Roman uh, writers and also maybe practitioners of rhetoric, Cicero, have you heard of him? Yeah. So he wrote books on this, on invention, how you should uh, invent a good speech, how you should structure it. He wrote another book called On the Orator, how you were a good orator. Here is the, perhaps the best uh, summarizer of all, uh, all the rhetoric of antiquity, Quintilian. And his book is called The Education of the Orator. This book is written sometime, it's like 300, 400 AD. So he really could build on the whole build up, the whole historical tradition of rhetoric. And this is perhaps the most quoted source of, if you want to get the complete coverage of what was done in that antique rhetoric. But here's another person, St. Augustine, who had, perhaps not so important as, as a summarizer of everything in, in rhetoric, but he extended rhetoric to Christian preaching, and he even gave it a special name. So, did I write the name? Yeah. Here, homilectics. Have you ever heard of this name? It means the rhetoric of preaching. So how should you convince people if you are in a church? That's homiletics. Okay. Uh, I think I managed to more to tell you what I wanted to. We'll, this is the last question for today. Does classical Greek and Roman rhetoric survive today in Greece and Italy? Who is from Italy here? Only Stefan. We can answer yes to that question, right? Mm, yes, but it's, it's really, it, yeah, it's really cool. well, I think it survives in Greece and Italy because it survives in the rest of the world. I mean, what we've been teaching you here in these courses on rhetoric is largely speaking this tradition. So, uh, where does classical Greek and Roman rhetoric survive today, I would say, in the whole world? <laughs> Especially, of course, the Western countries. Because uh, we, we, are much, we are very strongly colored by this. Perhaps somewhat lo less in China and India and so on, where you have other traditions which are strong. Are there attempts to alter this type of rhetoric in the world? Or? Well, I mean, you can see what other traditions we've looked at. We've looked at this Confucian tradition. We've looked at some of the Indian traditions. What you get then is, is probably, you know, types of rhetoric where you are not as uh, open to uh, what we call here... Uh, arguments. In yeah, discussion. strong arguments. Yeah. Where you're supposed to be more, pa you know, pacifying. Where you're supposed to seek consensus. Where you're supposed to be nicer to people, not to insult them, not to say you are wrong. Uh, for example, in, in, um, in feminist rhetoric, there might be some... Yeah, I saw, I've seen people who think that the, the, this uh, classical Greek Roman is not the good style. They want people to be much nicer to each other. So they would never say, uh, you are wrong, but they would say things like, I feel that maybe this could be done in a different way. <laughs> That's what, you know, so they try to subdue all conflicts. <laughs> yeah, I think there are people who sometimes come up with such ideas. Because, because there is a psychological aspect to it. Yeah. Everything here too. So you have to, in a sense, be strong here. You have to like you like to you like to compete and so and so on. If you are weak and if you don't like to compete and if you like people to be nice to you all the time, then this perhaps isn't the best kind of rhetoric. 